Now, what about other, are there any other people like, uh, for example, Elvia and so forth was going to try to join? She How did, we... she did for a few, for like 30 seconds and then she disappeared. Mr. Chair, you are live. Thank you. I'd like to call the uh, meeting of the Annapolis Transportation Board to order. Uh, welcome all. I see that we have present uh, Dave DeQuinzio, uh, Elizabeth Dolezal, Zoe Johnson, Tom Rikas, Carol Kelly, and uh, we have um, Mark Hildebrand is running the uh, technology for us. Kwaku is uh, on audio, if not video, and Charles Brooks uh, is on audio as well. Welcome all. And what I'd like to do is just plunge into the agenda. First of all, I did send out an agenda and one slightly annotated with some more late, late arriving information. And uh, let me throw the floor open to uh, any amendments to the agenda you would like to make for tonight. Hearing nothing, we proceed. The, um, there is now a period for comment by members of the public. And Mark, can you tell me whether that is even possible technically? Uh, we are not going to do live testimony until after October the 1st. Okay. So that's in the works. All right. Uh, and then finally, uh, we're coming to the, the treat of the evening. John Corrin from Bike uh, AAA is with us to uh, give us the latest on good things happening with bicycles in Annapolis and Anne Arundel County. Uh, you have uh, all been given a video on some materials in in the past about some of his activities, but it's always best to get it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So, John, it is yours. Well, thank you, Kurt, and thanks for thanks for inviting me to uh, speak with you today. Um, I'm going to show you a, a briefing. I'm going to go through quickly. I'm, going to, I'm aiming for 15 minutes or so, but I'm I'm more than happy. I almost would prefer to take questions or comments along the way. So don't feel like you have to hold them as long as that works for you, Kurt. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let me put this in slideshow. Can you all see that okay? Whoops, jump the gun. Can you see my, my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. So this is, um, I gave uh, this very presentation to the uh, Annapolis Planning Commission uh, just two weeks ago or so. Uh, first, just by way of introduction, there are two hats that I wear um, that, that bring me to this meeting. Uh, one is I chair the Anne Arundel County Bicycle Advisory Commission. Some of the members are shown uh, here in the upper left. That's a county appointed commission comprised of about a dozen citizen members that span the geography of the county, all seven council manic districts, a variety of uh, county agencies, but it also includes some reps from the city of Annapolis staff and also some citizen reps, including most recently, Kurt has joined the county um, bike commission. So I've got um, county folks, city of Annapolis folks, and also SHA folks. The other hat that I wear is Bicycle Advocates for Annapolis and Anne Arundel County. That's an all volunteer 501c3 that was launched in 2013 as a uh, project of Leadership Anne Arundel. I completed Leadership Anne Arundel in the 2012 to 2013 class. And um, that's, a, that's a very, very vibrant group with, with thousands of county cyclists on our, on our county contact list. And, all kinds of pro programs promoting uh, safe cycling for both transportation and education. Back in a, a quick bit of history, back in um, 2012 or so, the city of Annapolis applied for bike, bicycle friendly community designation by the League of American Bicyclists. The League is the national organization and they have a very, very rigorous rating system for bike friendly communities and a blueprint that guides communities to become more bike friendly. It goes bronze, silver, gold, platinum. 
I always like to say it's not like who's who in America. Send in $100 and they'll send you a plaque. It, it's a very, very rigorous process. Um, Annapolis failed to make bronze in 2012. Uh, the league sent them a deficiency report and said, you need to work on these things if you want to reach bronze. One of the deficiencies was uh, no, no bike advocacy group and no bike commission. And so that application by Ian Banks, when he worked for the city back then, uh, is a lot of the catalyst for, for forming this. And when we launched Bike AAA in 2013, one of our goals was to reach bronze. The city and the county applied together in 2018, and we were able to, to make the bronze designation. So, you know, one of the things, I give you that as background for how the two groups got started, what they set out to do, and that now that we've gotten to bronze, we're out to, uh, to achieve silver. Uh, here, th these are some of the things that I will talk to you about. And again, I'm gonna try to go pretty quickly. Uh, first, John, can you say something about what um, what it takes to reach silver from bronze? Yeah, um, it, the league tends to focus on what they call the five E's. So there's um, there's engineering, which is actually building out infrastructure, building out safe places to ride in a network. So adding infrastructure is important. There's um, education, so teaching people to ride safely. In fact, Alex Plein and I, many of you know Alex. Uh, Alex and I are actually doing a bike safety webinar uh, tomorrow night where we'll talk about bike safety techniques and uh, Maryland law as relates to bike safety. Encouragement programs, programs that encourage people to use a bicycle for transportation rather than getting in their car. And nationally, 40% or so of car trips are less than three miles. If we can provide a safe or comfortable alternative to driving, a percentage of the population will stop using their cars and start, start using um, biking or walking. So, you know, it's those types of things that they, they look at and, and measure. Um, a, a lot of them tie into the objectives that you see here on the left. So this isn't, this isn't so much about let's do stuff for bikes. This is about how do we reduce traffic in the city? How do we reduce the demand for parking? How do we better protect our air and water? How do we improve population health? How do we make our uh, local businesses more vibrant? How do we make the city a more affordable place to live? And if we, for a lot of families, transportation can be 20, 25% of, of uh, disposable income. If people, can live without, with one less car or without a car, that's a tremendous advantage in, in terms of, uh, of, of cost of living. So a lot of equity and um, economic benefits to this. So that's really the end game. And then getting people to bike or getting people to walk is really the means to that end. Um, this is a chart used across the nation. It's not, not a local chart. It's been used across the nation in bike advocacy. It takes the entire population, not the biking population, but the entire population, puts them in, into four categories with regard to bicycles. There's a 1% called the strong and fearless. Think of the bike messenger, the crazy guy that will bike in the middle of traffic and grab onto the back of a bus to go faster. And uh, those are the real crazies. If I go to the other end of the spectrum, there's about a third of the population is just not gonna ride a bike. Physical disability or just a preference, they're just not gonna ride a bike. There's a six or 7% group we call the confident and enthused. I'd put myself in that group. A lot of the riders that you see in spandex on their road bikes uh, are very comfortable riding on the road. There's a technique to it and it doesn't bother them to be with cars in most places. But the big group, the 60%, we call the interested but concerned. These are folks who would love to ride to the store or to work or to the doctor's appointment or to the ball field, to wherever they have to get to. They would much prefer to ride than get in the car, but they are simply not gonna do it unless they feel safe and comfortable. And comfortable is a little different from safe. There are a lot of places you can ride that are actually quite safe. 
biking over the Naval Academy Bridge, where you have a big, wide bike lane, is actually quite, quite safe. But for some folks, it's not comfortable because there's no physical separation between the bicyclists and the, and the motor vehicles. So to get to that 60%, we've got to make it safe. We've got to make it comfortable. The other thing you see here on the right side, the no choice cyclists, and this is true across the country, and there are many Annapolitans that fall into this category. There are folks that live in Annapolis that for economic reasons, for DUI reasons, for any of a variety of reasons, don't have a car, can't afford a car, can't get a driver's license, and they rely on a bicycle to, to get to wherever they have to get to. I call those the no choice cyclists. And it's, there's an equity um, imperative to make it safe for the no choice cyclists too. So when we think about this, it's the interested but concerned is the target. It's not the spandex guy who is perfectly, I'm perfectly happy biking down King George Street. I feel safe, but I'm, I'm in a very small fraction. We want to get a bigger slice of the pie uh, biking, or in some cases, walking. Uh, different types of bike facilities. I don't want to go too deep here, but uh, start in the lower right, the shared use trail, like the BNA trail, uh, the Poplar Trail in Annapolis, the trail around the Naval Academy Stadium, a, completely tra a trail that's paved and completely separate from the roadway, is the most comfortable place to ride. Let's go to the upper left, is called a protected bike lane or sometimes called a cycle track. There's some physical separation. In the picture, you see a median strip with planters, there's some, a jersey wall, there's some physical separation between the bikes and the cars. We don't have any of those in Anne Arundel County. There's a conventional bike lane down in the lower left. There are a, a number of these in Annapolis. Uh, Hilltop, Edgewood, um, Bay Ridge, uh, Melvin Avenue. There's a variety of roads with bike lanes. Relatively safe, but for, for many not comfortable. There's something called the Sharrow, and there are lots of Sharrows now in downtown Annapolis, thanks to a grant that Eric Evans and Downtown Annapolis Partnership provided the city. Those are in the lower middle. That's where there's a bike symbol and a chevron, the arrows, but there's no stripes. That's a little less comfortable. It's a visual cue to drivers, be cautious of cyclists on this roadway. But again, it's, it's sort of the least com comfortable of the bikeways that are on here. So I want, I want you to just have the background of the different types of bike facilities that, that are possible. Uh, I'm going to skip past this. There's other, there's signage, there's signals, there's, there's other things that make uh, bike infrastructure more comfortable as well, but I, I won't go too deep into that right now. Uh, in 2011, uh, Anna, the city of Annapolis updated its bicycle master plan, and it calls for a network, as you, as you can sort of see visually on the left side. If you're contemplating biking from your home to a destination, your decision is only as good as the least comfortable segment that you have to traverse to get to your destination. And so creating a network where all of the bike infrastructure is infrastructure is connected to one another is what's gonna get a bigger fraction of the population out biking and walking. On the right side, and I, I know you can't see the detail very well, but on the right side was the current state in 2011 and what you see are a lot of little segments. There's a bike lane on Hilltop. There's a bike lane on Edgewood. There's, there's a bike lane on Admiral Drive. There's a Poplar Trail, but they're not connected to one another. So it's a very comfortable segment if you can get there, but not connected. Um, on the left is the current state of uh, bikeways in the city of Annapolis. And here it's color-coded by the type of facility. So there are just a few trails, paved trails or shared use paths, Poplar Trail, Spot Creek Trail, and the um, loop around the, the Naval Stadium. And then there's a handful of bike lanes. And again, I mentioned the downtown Sharrows that went, have gone in in the, in the last year or two. There's been relatively few additions since the 2011 master plan. Uh, one very small but important one, one was the opening of Victor Parkway. You know where Victor Parkway is between uh, Bay Ridge Road and the giant Georgetown Road? 
there used to be a chain link fence across Victor Parkway to, to keep cars from traversing. There was a little opening in the sidewalk that you could get through. We recommended to the city and the city did this. And in fact, uh, it was opened up about two years ago. Take the chain link fence away, put some bollards up to keep the vehicles from going through but make it safe and comfortable for bikes to go back and forth that way. Small, but again, it opens up, it closes another gap in the network. Uh, and by the way, for emergency use, when, you know, once in a while something happens, power lines come down, Bay Ridge Road is shut and that Annapolis neck is, uh, is it can't move. The bollards can be removed for, in, in case of emergency. Chinkapin Round Road uh, got some bike lanes during a repaving project at downtown Sharrows. And there, there've been some others here and there, but there's still a lot of work to be done to convert this all into a connected network. Now, countywide, we have a vision, we, Bike AAA, the Bike Commission working together for a trail network that would be a complete loop around the Northern half of the company, uh, uh, county, it goes through the town centers, the current and planned town centers, and I include Annapolis as a town center, Parole, Odenton, Glen Burnie are the official town centers in the, in the, uh, in the county planning. It's a complete loop connecting all of those and then having spurs, a spur to the north to Baltimore City, a spur to the west to Howard County, a spur to the south that would connect to the Capitol Trails Network and on uh, in, into DC, and then to be loads of little teeny connectors from neighborhoods, from libraries, from schools, um, from other destinations that would connect to this loop. If I zoom in on um, Greater Annapolis, you can see, you know, and you saw in the previous chart, we have gaps where you see yellow. Those are gaps in the county network. And within the city, you can see to get through Annapolis, we have gaps and the, you know, the vision is to try to get it as much of this trail as possible. So on this slide, I show where the trails in and, out, in and around Annapolis are. So you, of course you have the BNA coming down the Broadneck Peninsula and then switching over to bike lane to get over the Naval Academy Bridge, but then you have nothing. I'll come back to that. Um, Poplar Trail, Spock Creek Trail, Naval Academy Loop. The South Shore Trail is actually in the county, but close to the city of Annapolis. That is a planned trail that'll go from Anne Arundel Medical Center, where there's a short segment already built, all the way to Odenton, where it will connect to the existing WBNA trail, Washington, Baltimore, Annapolis trail, as well as other trails. Phase one was ribbon cut um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we, just, we just secured funding for uh, construction of phase two of the South Shore Trail. So, but you can see, even there, like to get from, how do you get from the Poplar Trail to the South Shore Trail? You got to ride on roads with cars. So it's all about how do we close these gaps? Uh, we, you hear Gavin Buckley talk about the WE, the West East Expressway. That would be, that, that's a vision for a trail from think foot of Naval Academy Bridge through the city and then on out to meet the um, South Shore Trail, where it, that would continue on west, including connections to Waterworks Park, which has off-road um, biking facilities now. Waterworks Park, of course, is land that's outside the city limits, but it's 600 acres that's owned by the city. Um, in all of these gap areas, the good news is we have activity of some kind or another underway. So for example, where letter A is, the yellow that you see, the red line is the Naval Academy Bridge. And then you see the yellow is a gap from there to the Naval Academy Stadium Trail. And, and then also a gap over to, to uh, King George Street and St. John's College. SHA at our request, and when I say our request, at the request of kind of a little consortium, if you will, of the city of Annapolis, Anne Arundel County, U.S. Naval Academy, and, and I'm very happy Zoe's on this call and was, was on the Planning Commission call, uh, and Bike AAA and the Bike Advocates. And SHA just completed a study, feasibility said what could be done in that gap area. 
There's a county uh, study, county and city study underway looking at how do we extend the Poplar Trail West. Poplar Trail currently runs from Taylor Avenue at the police station out to Admiral Drive. How can we continue that out to approximately to the Double T Diner where it would connect to an existing side path that crosses under 50 over to the hospital and meets up with the South Shore Trail. So you have all these gaps and I'm happy to say in, in many of the gap areas, there's some work underway, some study work or stay tuned, design work. Um, we worked with the city to apply for a Maryland Bikeways grant. The, bike, the Maryland Bikeways program has been around since 2011. It's where the state makes grants to uh, municipalities, counties and cities across the state for um, design work, feasibility studies, and even small construction projects. Um, the city just was, a, just was awarded and just put out a press release on Friday, awarded a $224,000 grant from the state to do design work at five of these gap areas. Now, when you get to 65% design, that enables you to then apply for construction funding. The big money, the, count, the way the county funds a lot of its trail building, like the Broadneck Trail, which will go from the b &A Trail in Severna Park all the way out to Sandy Point Park. Two phases are done. The third will go into construction uh, in the next six, nine months or so. Most of the construction is funded by uh, Federal Transportation Alternatives Program, TAP grants. Um, those, are mil those are grants measured in the millions, but you've got to be through design before you can apply for those. So the bikeways program can be instrumental in applying for design. The hiker biker bridge over the Patuxent River, which will connect the six mile existing Anne Arundel County WBNA trail that starts in Odent and goes down to the river, will connect to the four mile WBNA trail in PG County when this hiker biker trail is built. The bikeways program funded half a million dollars or, or so for design. And then the county secured a $4.7 million construction grant to build it. So this is really, really important. And one message for this transportation board, you have got to budget. These grants are typically a 20% match from the locality. So Sally Nash budget made sure the city had the $55,000 20% match here. If you wanna get the big construction money, You've got to put into your into your capital plan your 20% match, so we can get, we can go get bigger money to do construction. So that's some of the work that's underway. Um, I'm going to try to I'm going to go through this next slide or two quickly. There's also a variety of policy things that are important to do, in, in addition to actually actual pro, on the road, on the ground sort of projects. So, for example, you have a comprehensive plan update that's just getting underway, just as the county GDP plan 2040 is underway. You've got to make sure that transportation policy and land use policy are fully integrated. Land use decisions both affect and rely on transportation decisions. So the way things get built, the types of things that get built and where they get built, all that policy needs to work in a way that makes the city of Annapolis, a place where more people can live and work without daily use of a car. I'm sure you know the millennials are looking for places to live for economic reasons and for lifestyle reasons, are looking for places to live where you don't have to own a car or at least not use one every day. You can be sure Amazon was only gonna pick an HQ2 location that had access to transit, access to biking, access to walking. It's why they're, you know, they're near National Airport. Uh, with all the trail infrastructure and bike lanes uh, in, in Arlington. Uh, the bicycle master 2011 ma bike master plan should be updated. Uh, there are other things that can probably be done in, in code. Uh, your, um, the county is now looking at its APFO ordinances to make it more multimodal, not just how, how, what's the impact on traffic. I think the city actually has a more multimodal view of uh, adequate public facilities transportation than the county does. But anyway, we encourage you to, to, to take a look at um, policy 
legislation that encourages alternative modes to, uh, to driving. The Move Anne Arundel Strategic Transportation Plan for the, for the county, which was approved unanimously by county council uh, last November, has specific quantified targets for changing the mode share of Anne Arundel County. By mode share, I mean how many people drive in single, single occupancy vehicles, how many drive in uh, multiple people in the car, in the car, how many bike, how many walk, how many use transit. And today you might add to that how many telecommute. All, you know, all the alternate modes reduce traffic, protect the environment, improve health, et, et, et cetera. Um, John, where in the world do they get data on those? Uh on the uh, breakout among transportation the, modes? You know, it, it's not terribly reliable, but the US Census, America, uh, commu uh, it's called the American Community Survey, actually measures mode. Uh, we've done some, uh, back in the day at the request of Ian Banks, we did some manual counts. We had volunteers at it, six intersections in Annapolis, AM and PM rush hour, counting uh, how many bikes are going by in, and in what direction? And do they appear to be a commuter or do they appear to be a um, recreation or fitness rider? Um, there, uh, there are counters that you can buy that will that can measure, is, was that a cyclist that went by or a um, pedestrian that went by and in what direction? Since Google is uh, following every cell phone in the, uh, in the country, one wonders if they could aggregate those data in a in a way that tells you this it's quite yeah it's it, that that's possible that's possible so you, you know um we recommended to the county and they acted on this to create a position in the county for a full-time bicycle and pedestrian transportation planner uh that was done and we now have tanya asman who used to work in planning and zoning at the county comes to work every day off transportation to with a focus on bicycle and pedestrian planning. Uh, we used to have Ian Banks, a fraction of his, uh, and I'm happy that my friend Kwaku is on this call, uh, but Ian had a fraction of his time uh, dedicated to uh, bike ped planning. We recommend the city assign somebody with this responsibility. Could be in trans office transportation, could be in public works, could be in planning and zoning. I'll leave it to the city to figure out where, but um, there's pretty good support in the city, uh, certainly from the mayor. There's good support among staff, but it, it, there's a difference when it's somebody's job every day to come in and, um, and, and, and worry about this type of thing. So I'm gonna stop there um, and, uh, and throw it open to questions or comments. I've got a question, John. You had said one of your slides, the one before this one, I think said uh, that there, the city could be, yeah, the, the bike friendly community. Is that like the bee friendly community? <laughs> I mean, does, so the, is there an organization that, that certifies communities? That yeah, way? did you, LV, I, you, you, I don't know if you saw my opening slide. I, I came in late, put, I was in another meeting, I'm sorry. Okay, but yeah, the League of American Bicyclists has a rating system, bronze, silver, gold, platinum. Okay, sorry, I uh, asked this, a question. Okay. Yeah, that's no, it's okay. The city applied in 2012 and could not reach bronze. The city and the county, with our help, reapplied in 2018 and was able to secure bronze. And now we're, now we're wanting to get to silver. Thanks. John, thanks for your, your list of things that we can do. The action recommendations, we will consult that. And I can hope I help you question? on those. Yeah, Beth? Yes, um, it's the same question Kurt asked actually. What does it take to become silver? Um, I mean, what changes, what, what additions, what, what would it take to become silver? So the, the, the most important one would be strong, a stronger connected infrastructure. That by far is, is, is the most important. So adding uh, new trails, new bike lanes, and the safer, the better, the more comfortable, the better 
is absolutely the most in, in, important thing for two reasons. One is the league will measure what progress have you made on your infrastructure, but more importantly, if you build it, they will ride. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if we create this safe network, then more people in that 60% interested but concerned will choose to say, you know, in, instead of driving my car one mile to, to uh, CVS, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, now that they have this bike lane built, I'm gonna get on my bike and ride over there and, and pick up my toothpaste. Um, and, and so infrastructure will, is important in its own right, but it's more important in that it'll get more people riding and in particular, more people riding for transportation. Again, some people ride for, for recreation or for fitness, but the prize is getting pe more people riding for yes. transportation as an alternative to their, to their car. And there's a big benefit to people who don't ride because if we get more people biking downtown, there'll be less traffic for the people who either must drive because of, of an ability or a preference. Um, the, you know, the, 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 there's a big, there's a value proposition for them too. Sure. I have another question. Um, how these trails, um, I understand you need, um, obviously you need right of ways and you need um, all kinds of, um, um, ability to legally go through people's property or, or whatever. So all that gets done. And, uh, but how many, do you, do you use volunteers to help build these trails to, for, for various reasons? One, of course, to cut costs so that you do more with less money. But the other is for um, people to become part of not just the writing, but part of the creation of what you're doing. And sometimes that makes a difference as well. So I'm just wondering. It's a great question, Beth. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this distinction. There's off-road mountain bike trails, natural surface, dirt trails. And then there are paved trails like the BNA trail or in Annapolis, the trail around the stadium, paved trails, which are used for both recreation and for transportation. The, the off-road trails and specifically the off-road trails at Waterworks that are now built at Waterworks Park, which is a city facility and at Bacon Ridge, which is a county facility in uh, a county natural area in Crownsville, those off-road trails were, were built entirely with volunteer labor. Dozens of people out on a Saturday and Sunday morning with other volunteers who are sort of almost like professionals on how to do it, that bring tools, train people, bring in the pizza, bring in the Gatorade, and dozens and dozens, dozens of volunteers have built those natural surface trails. Okay. The, um, and, and so right of way is easier once you get permission to build in a, in a controlled natural area. And by the way, it's done in an environmentally sensitive way. It's done considering stormwater flows and you know, that type of thing. But building um, shared use paths, as we call them, paved trails, especially in the city of Annapolis where right of way is so dear and is been, much of it's been given up to private ownership. Securing the right of way, as you, po as you pointed out, is very difficult. And then the actual, when, if you can secure the right of way, the actual design and construction, it's got to be done by professionals. The design work um, yeah, considers you know, terrain and storm water and loads and soil and in addition to rights of way and roadway crossings and all of that, it must be done by, the design's gotta be done by professionals. And then of course the construction's gotta be done. So the offer, offer, offer I, I wish we could, uh, now there's something called tactical urbanism where a group goes out at midnight and, <laughs> and, and buys a hundred plungers from Home Depot 
and puts them up, puts them on the roadway and creates a uh, and with some spray paint creates uh, a, a midnight bike lane. But um, oh shoot, I forgot this is being taped. I didn't say any of that. <laughs> that that's, uh, sounds like the military midnight requisitioning. <laughs> That sounds like military midnight requisitioning, you know? John, I have a, a sort of a, a big picture idea, a question to put to you. These projects are wonderful. And uh, please let us know any, any way that the transportation board can be helpful in advancing all of the connections that the infrastructure projects that you've identified uh, will, will be building out. The, the big question is why do we have to do these one by one by one? Is there any prospect, can you think of any way of getting this in, into the state budget so that there is a mandate that if you do something to a road, some fraction of those funds be devoted to safe cycling uh, or other uh, uh, funding mechanisms which are larger and more dependable for the long term? Well, the, the one grant possibility, and th th these are hard to get, but it is a possibility that's out there. Uh, they used to be called Tiger Grants. They're now called Build Grants. These are, these are very large federal grants, which can go to uh, alternative transportation projects, especially in underserved areas. And these can be, you know, five, 10, $15 million grants. Um, but you've, the, the, you've got to do a lot of the design work first to prepare for for that that type of a grant and so uh that is that is something that's out there it's been talked about some um at bike commission i think city of annapolis i think could could possibly be a candidate for that um it's been talked about just a little bit in north county uh, brooklyn park um linthicum area actually the county just got a grant for some design work um up, up in that part of the world, but you know that is a possibility. We worked hard, we, the, the state advocates, and I'm very active at the state legislature when it's in session. You'll, it's not unusual to see me in a coat and tie on my hybrid bike going over the Naval Academy Bridge in, in January to April when the legislature's in session to go, uh, I think Elvia maybe has seen me down there uh, your office is right, <laughs> is right there, Elvia. Um, and then I get the best parking spot, mm -hmm. better than the speaker, better than the president of the Senate, because I chain my bike up to a railing that's right outside the door, to either, either the Miller Senate building or the, or the, uh, the house building across the street. But um, we, we worked so hard to get this bikeways program to bump its funding up from $2 million a year to $3.8 million a year. And that's spread across the whole state. Um, SHA's got some of its own money. The, the uh, study that Zoe and I are involved in between the Naval Academy Bridge, Section A on this map, uh, that's, that's feasibility studies being funded by SHA themselves. But trying to get from feasibility to design, it's money is dear. And, it's, and you know, with COVID, it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be even more challenging looking ahead, I, I'm afraid. Yeah. Hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in SHA for roads seems to be relatively easy to get, but the, uh, the thousands and a few million here and there for bicycle in infrastructure are very hard fought for. I have a question, Thanks. but I want to defer to um, David. If, if he's still got a question, I heard him start to ask something. Are you I there? started to ask. I started. But you can, oh, Carol, okay. I'll come back. Should I go? Yes, I'll come oh. back. Uh, John, remind me of the, uh, the percentage of the purple people. The purple people are the no way, never, right? The three, yeah, it's, a, it's like 30, 33%. And the uh, interested but concerned are? About 60%. I'm particularly interested in connecting the idea of multimodal transportation with biking because the reality, I think, of what we're seeing in these infrastructure maps and in line with Kurt's question, 
is that the funding for a network like this that is continuous is another major infrastructure project. And, you know, we don't even have highways uh, in good state. So my suggestion or my, my wondering really is um, to what extent are the multimodal people seeing transit services as connecting bicyclists who want to bicycle, you know, they want to take advantage of the trail to safe trails. In other words, if somebody like a younger me uh, could put a bicycle on a bus and get to one of the more extensive trails, which is safely paved and, uh, and comfortable to ride and also crosses some distance, um, that could be promoted possibly. And it would, it would, you know, it would go along with promoting the transit service for other people who would, you know, un be ever always unable to do anything with the biking component. I'm, I mean, that's a that's a fairly complex. Uh, no, it's a good, Carol. Thank you for the question um, be because it's really important. Because with transit, you always have the last mile challenge at either end, whether it's whether it's rail or bus transit you always have the question of how does the user get to the bus stop or the rail station and how do they get from the other, at the other end, how do they get to their destination? And frequently that's, that's a, relative, a relatively short distance. So for example, the Odenton Mark station, which is one of the busiest Mark stations in, in the entire uh, rail network in the state of Maryland. I think it might be the busiest other than Baltimore Union Station. I was told several years ago that something like four or 500 people drive to that station less than two miles every day. Now, if you provide, and with all the building going on around Fort Meade and in Odenton, um, if you provide safe biking and walking routes, you're not gonna get all of them out of their cars. But if you get a fraction, a bigger fraction of them out of their cars, and maybe even put some economic incentives. If you drive, you're gonna to have to pay to park. If you bike or walk, what you were gonna give you free. MTA is very, very in favor of what you're describing. MTA has increased the number of uh, bike racks at, at um, rail stations. They have added new cars on Mark that accommodate bikes, uh, light rail, uh, will permit, permit bikes. So y your question is really important. The whole idea of transit oriented development, TOD, is get people, get people to live close to transit so that they can live either car free or as I describe it, car light, where they may have to own a car but not use it every single day. So for example, the county council just unanimously, just about two weeks ago, unanimously passed a bill for Glen Burnie redevelopment. And so part of the motivation is, is economic, is redevelopment of, a, of a, an area that's, that's been neglected. It's fallen into some disrepair. But the other important thing about it is it's very close to, to uh, Cromwell Station light rail. And the BNA trail runs right through the, the center of Glen Burnie. And so you have the possibility of of residential development there and the possibility of living and working there with doing exactly as you described, bike or walk to the light rail to, and then go to my job in Baltimore City or wherever it happens to be. And so, then, John, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, let me uh, just get in here. I see the clock on the wall has us 45 minutes into our agenda. And what I'd like to do, if it's all right with everybody, is to thank you, John, for a, a fascinating presentation and an action list for us to uh, turn our attention to. Uh, we really want to help out. And, uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Well, Kurt, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, my reputation is intact. I ex well exceeded my allotted time. <laughs> Everybody does. <laughs> okay, thanks a bunch. Thank so you. I, I will now turn to the agenda. Um, uh, next is 5A on the agenda report on related transportation groups. So the only thing I have to say is that I have continued to uh, um, serve on the um, 
the Bicycle uh, Transportation Commission that John mentioned. Uh, I'm also sitting in on uh, County Transportation Commission meetings. And by the way, welcome to uh, Arjan van Andel, who is uh, not here visibly, but I gather he's listening to us. He's the chairman of the County Commission. And welcome to others who uh, joined somewhat late, uh, Charles Brooks, L.A. Tierney, and uh, anybody else? I think that's everybody. Uh, welcome indeed. And there's Arjan. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm listening. So I uh, just put my, uh, my video off. So thank okay. you for the opportunity. You bet. One of uh, my partners in crime. Uh, are there any other uh, contributions from members of the uh, board for uh, things that you have been doing with other transportation oriented groups? Um, I'm going to uh, start com coming or virtually um, attending the uh, Transportation Commission meetings of the uh, county. Are they virtual, Kurt? So far, yes, Arianne. But, uh, still yes, they are. I, I yes. mean, my, my pandemic laziness has not motivated me yet, but I've, I've put the dates down for the fall. Um, mm -hmm. And in that regard, since I've had a longstanding and very comfortable of acquaintance with uh, Ramon Robinson. I, I, I've spoken to him about my kind of representational uh, character of being a, a, a resident of parole and a, uh, a diehard Annapolitan and uh, hoping that in some way we can, uh, you know, make our board and that commission um, just more conversational, if nothing else. Uh, I'm, you know, certainly not proposing any policy or Okay. legislative approach at this point, but I think- Fine, I'm glad you'll be doing that. Uh, turning now to 5B legislation, let's go through, uh, there, there are several items here. Um, first of all, uh, there is an item of legislation that um, is before the council now, it's 03120, standards for the, the use of non-motorized wheel vehicles on sidewalks and establishing a definition. Uh, this. Uh, legislation has been introduced um, and I'm just flagging it for uh, for you to read and for us to make comment on it looked quite good to me I have I really have nothing constructive to offer apart from the fact that I think it's it's a good legislation and it will improve the access and the clarity of access for Annapolis residents on our our sidewalks. Sure. Can I ask a question about this legislation? Sure. Is this a is this a completely new section of code, or is it amending the code? I was a little confused by the the red text and then the crop the you know the strikeouts. Just a little the, bit of background. I hadn't been tracking this. The strikeouts uh, are clear. Usually, if it's in bold, that's added text. I don't have it in front of me here. So. Uh, so is this an entire? So this is just. Um, amending an existing section on driving on sidewalks? Correct, So This is amending uh, Title 12, Chapter 12.48. Um, it's already existing code, and it's being done to clarify language of the existing code. I think Sally Nash's staff report um, makes it pretty clear what this is all about. Okay. So there was ambiguous language. This cleans it up. Okay, that, yeah. that's helpful. I mean, that's I didn't right. know whether whether there are issues with bicycles in terms of safety on sidewalks currently. I mean, if the city has a problem with that, I mean, I, I think pe pre people do it pretty liberally. Kurt, uh, if I may. If I may. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, so so the, the state of Maryland prohibits bicycles on sidewalks statewide unless expressly permitted by the local municipality. And there's just a handful of municipalities across Maryland who have done that. The, the city of Annapolis has had an, an ordinance and it's, it's being, as um, was said, just said earlier, it's being clarified, which said, you may not ride a bicycle negligently on a sidewalk, period. It did not expressly say you, you can ride a bicycle safely. It just said you cannot ride a bicycle negligently on the sidewalk. So if you couple that with, with a state law prohibition, it leaves a question of, well, am I allowed to ride or not? 
I think the purpose of the of the this new ordinance is just to clarify that to say, yes, yes, it's permitted, but you have to do it non non negligently. Exactly, it it cleans up the language and makes it much much clearer than it was before, and uh, it looks fine to me as written. But I'd really like everybody to look at it uh, critically and see if we have any further comment on it. And John mentioned the state law. That's the next item on the agenda. It's twenty one dash eleven o three, and as John says, uh, it forbids the riding of bicycles on sidewalks statewide unless the locality uh, expressly permits it. And oddly enough, Annapolis at the moment doesn't expressly permit it. And that's what the cleaned up language would do. Um, the, um, in my view, and I, I think the city ordinance uh, should be supported and passed and so forth. But the better solution uh, in my view is to look at this, the state code and basically reverse it, do a 180 degree turn. And uh, uh, I distributed to you some suggested language, which has been shared with John and some other people that would basically say that uh, the state uh, permits the riding on bicycles so long as it's safe and uh, so long as the locality does not forbid it. So it really turns it 180 degrees around. And so I commend it to you uh, for your review and uh, what I would like to do if there is support on the board is to uh, draft a, um, a recommendation to the city council and to the state for altering that law. I'd like to uh, pulse the board to find out whether there is general support for looking at this and, and making a recommendation. Well, it hasn't, Ashley just sent out a chat, a, a statement in chat that said, where she said that she had um, written um, the code for the city, I thought it said, let me see. Well, that must be the legislation that we're talking about, 03120. Okay. I helped draft it. It was just a clarification of city code, but I'm happy to explain further. That's 03120. Yes. So um, if that's true, then we don't need, if that's, and we agree with what's been the draft, then we don't need to do anything else on that, on on that, because it's already in in process. Well, there are three. There are three options. We can do nothing. The second is to offer our words of support, and the third is to uh, either object or offer words of amendment uh, to suggest. And uh, well, all we of those things are open. I I personally favor supporting it. Uh, well, we the, can. It's true, but I mean, we if we we would support what's already. What I'm saying is what's already been done rather than, it sounded like you wanted us to-, to It hasn't been done. It, it is a proposed modification of legislation. It's, it has not been passed yet. No, but it's already been worded as a proposal. And so the question of the board is, are you satisfied with the wording? Did we see it? Is I sent it to, yes, it's been sent to everybody. Okay, what you sent was what the state did, 21-1103. That's yes, the state. that was sent also. Well, it's- Anyway, uh, look over the email. It's all there. And uh, I, I think yeah. probably not necessary to do this right now. But I wanted to introduce that to the members of the board. Uh, and if it's, if it's all right with you, what I propose doing and I'd like help on this if anybody's interested. I would like to draft a statement by the transportation board um, with regard to uh, these two items, both the city and the state. Kurt, I don't, I didn't see the the city ordinance as well. Um, it, it was the state language that I was when I asked yes. my question. So maybe we need. Uh, I hate to postpone, but maybe we need a minute or, or some time to take a look at that city ordinance before we can rec we can support or voice our support for it. I mean, in, in theory, it sounds like it's it's clarifying existing language, yeah, which sounds right. appropriate. It just I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable, you know, voicing support without having taken a look at it. Yeah, I agree with you, Zoe. I, it's not in my email either. I got the state one, but not the city. I didn't get the city word. Uh, so. Don't do you have the agenda? Yeah. Yes. 
um, there should be a hyperlink on the city, O3120. If you just click on that, it's there. Okay. And it, it's possible to get it simply by clicking on the email of the agenda or going to the city. Yes. Yeah. Well, when I said you had been given it, I've, you were given a hyperlink to the legislation. Okay. That's uh, Kurt. I, if, think Zoe, if, I think Zoe and I are, are alike. I, I read the agenda and I saw they were hyperlinks. I didn't think about going out. I was I did it at the last minute, and uh, so therefore, and yet you did supply the one for the state. So I got a little confused as to the fact I didn't I think, get one for yeah. the city. Yeah, I think I was confused by that. I thought that was the language that we were yes. using. Kurt, at the risk of, of um, opening Pandora's box, there's one nuanced issue that's really important in, in both of these um, ordinances. And that has to do with e-bikes and e-scooters and e-whatever, e-hoverboards -hover, and whatever's next. Um, at the state level, a law was passed a year or two ago that um, defines e-bikes as bicycles and establishes three classes of e-bikes, class one, two, and three, based upon their power and whether or not they have a throttle or on, only pedal assist. There's another state law that was passed that defines e-scooters based upon what, the, you know, their geometry and how they work and so forth, and defines e-scooters as bicycles. So the, the question arises in Annapolis, if you allow bicycles on the sidewalk, what about e-bikes? And is it all, and if you're silent, because I think the current O3120 refers to non-motorized. So does non-motorized mean something that's exclusively motorized? or does it include e-bikes? Because again, in state law, the word bicycles, unless otherwise specified, is, is going to include e-bikes and is going to include e-scooters. There's a school of thought on this that, that I tend to, to uh, resonate with that says, manage the behavior, not the, de not the device. We have this question even like on the B&A trail, should e-bikes be allowed? And the question is, what you know what's worse is it grandpa riding an e-bike because if he doesn't use an e-bike he's not he can't use any bike or lance armstrong wannabe barreling down the trail at 25 miles an hour manage the behavior not the device we don't say no maseratis allowed on the road because they can go 200 miles an hour we say the speed limit is 40 miles an hour you've got so you know, with the emergence of, of so many uh, electric assisted devices, which provide mobility to a, a much broader range of ages and abilities, it, it's just something that needs to be considered in this conversation. Yes, uh, I'm not sure whether, yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, the, but the concept of reversing the default in state law is one that we can address without getting into those details, can we not, John? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if it's all right with you, I'd like to leave it this way, um, that um, with anybody who volunteers to work with me on this, I will develop language to address both of these, both the city and the state uh, laws. And uh, we will come back the next time to have an actionable item. Does that meet with everybody's approval? Now that I'm looking at the city code, can you tell us one more time what you were proposing? You said you were gonna flip it on its head, 180 degrees. Not the city code, the Not state. The city. The state, the state. One, more, one more time, what were you proposing? The, the state forbids um, bicycles on sidewalks unless the locality allows them. And the proposed wording change, and I sent that to you, uh, would just flip that around saying that the state uh, allows it unless it is prohibited by the locality. If you look at um, 
at uh, sidewalks going out of Annapolis, Bestgate Road is a, a fine example. The law right now requires uh, school children who want to ride a bicycle to do so on Bestgate Road and not on the sidewalk, which is right next to it. And this is insane. And uh, that's, that's an example of a situation that would be improved by turning this around. Ellie? Oh, thank you. I, thank you, Beth. Um, I just want to make it clear that the ordinance does define uh, what non-motorized wheel vehicle is, and it is more than just bicycles. You probably know this, but um, it, it includes skateboards and skating and rollerblades, um, unicycles, <laughs> uh, and, and that was part of the objective. Um, there was a lot of concern about the skateboarding um, issue. So that was um, one of the objectives of this legislation to allow, but then um, have the parameters for safety. Yeah, thank so you. So it isn't limited to just bicycles. I just want to make that clear. Yes. Basically, anything that has a wheel is included. But it does say non motorized wheeled, wheeled vehicles, so that. It does raise the question about the e device, the electric assist devices. That's true. That's still a that's still a question which is unaddressed. Um, so I don't know whether we need to do that on the transportation board uh, as we look at this, but it's an important point. Somebody's going to have to deal with it. Okay. Um, the final piece of legislation, if if there's nothing more on that that I wanted to draw your attention to, was. Um, something that uh, Alderwoman Tierney just shared with me today, and that is uh, R5420, um, which is a resolution in basically um, uh, supporting the resolution that we had passed on to the city council, supporting the blueprint for uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, Alderwoman Tierney, would you like to say anything about that? And David DeQuinzio, who's been deep into this, may have some comments too. Uh, well, I thought it was important that we incorporate the resolution that you you um, elo eloquently wrote and um, and subject to our Office of Law. So I feel pretty good about this resolution doing just that. Um, and and. Um, we, we hope to get it on its agenda ready, um, and, and that, that would mean it would be on um, the next council meeting agenda. However, as you know, we, we don't act on legislation. It's every other meeting now, so right. unless it's something we need to suspend the rules on. But I just want you to know, um, but I, I would, um, if you need time to look at it um, and respond before then, that would, that would be ideal. That's great. Yeah, I, I would look with the uh, approval of the board. Uh, we will plan to do just that. Thank you very much, David. You originated this. Do you want to say anything about it? Um, well, just I want to say thank you uh, to Alder Woman Tierney for uh, using the language I wrote. I'm delighted to hear that you found it um, useful. Uh, that you didn't have to re that you found that you didn't have to or felt that you didn't have to rework it a lot or anything. Um, so I'll, I'll take that as kind of a compliment <laughs> that I wrote something um, useful. Um, and just um, just to extend um, the offer I previously made uh, with when the time comes, I'm happy to present or support, defend whatever. Um, I'm sure some people will have questions, maybe members of the public or maybe your fellow uh, um, council members or the mayor. Um, um, you know, if, if I just have some notice in terms of um, when to be ready, <laughs> but I will be ready uh, to support um, and uh, answer whatever questions come up. Okay, thanks very much. Moving on to 5C, uh, we've already covered the blueprint for autonomous urbanism. There was one other item that Dave uh, uh, originated, and that was a recommendation that we get uh, our local um, uh, delegation involved in the transportation 
caucus. And uh, indeed, we have heard that Dana Jones is, uh, is joining that caucus. So one member of our D30 uh, delegation will, will be on the transportation caucus. Do you have anything else on that, Dave? Uh, just, just also that um, there, we did get an email uh, that Senator Elfrith will join as well. So that's two out oh. of three, and I think that's pretty yeah. darn good. Yeah, one in the Senate, one in the House of Delegates. Yep. That's fine. All right, uh, Tom Rikus had to run off. I assume he is now gone. Um, and we have, um, uh, he and you all worked on the residential parking privileges recommendation of the city council, which uh, has been sent to the council. And um, uh, Ellie wrote a nice note in response. And I got uh, a note also from uh, the transportation director. Uh, so that will, uh, that will be considered. All right. Um, at this point, we're down to 5D and going around the table. And so I just throw the floor open. Let's go around the table and uh, I'll call your names. Uh, such items as you would like to introduce and give a status report on. The floor is yours. Uh, Tom Rikus is not here. Beth? You're muted. You are muted. Yes. Yeah. The, okay. the business of um, um, having the residents display their parking stickers um, is in process. Um, Ellie is probably better to say where that is right now. Of course, uh, during summer session, there wasn't a council meeting and, and we have to have the first reader and the second reader and such and so on. So um, I'm trying to think what you told me, Ali. I think, I think that it's going to come up in September, October. Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's correct. It, it will be in October, uh, probably the meeting after this coming meeting. And um, so what does that mean though? And I don't, is Rick Gordon on the, on the, um, no, Rick Gordon, oh, okay. Yeah, because um, what, because the, um, the fiscal year started for SP plus and they sent, you know, residential parking permits have been purchased and then they, they, they send them out with that note about it being displayed and so next, that won't be until next year that they, the parking company will reiterate the revised code. Um, so what we intend to do is, um, is have a public, you know, a press release uh, basically um, so that we can start um, uh, monitoring and, and um, hopefully not citing, but um, just let it be known yeah. that we're monitoring the stickers. And, well, and hopefully should, they still have them. Some people, I don't know why they would, but may, maybe they threw them away people, when they got them in the mail. But um, a lot of people they keep can always them. get another one. Yeah, a lot of people so, keep yeah, them. It's she disappeared. Oh. Ellie? Yeah. Ellie, yeah. yeah. There you, are, you disappeared. I know. Your Wi Fi I connection may, may be a little shaky. Yeah. But <clears throat> the other is any new people can get the updated letter. And and start displaying them as well. Any anybody who, you know knew, and um, um, and then a lot of people keep them. Like my next door neighbor keeps them. They don't always put them on. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. But they do keep them. So if they have them, hopefully yeah. they can put them on once a press release goes out. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, great. Thanks, Beth. The uh, Kara Pluwinski was on for literally three seconds and I don't see her now. So I will move on to Carol Kelly. Who has already spoken of my All right. in uh, <laughs> county and uh, city transportation cooperation. Yes, thank you. Uh, Zoe. Good evening, everyone. Um, I wanna thank John Corrin for that presentation earlier. Um, as he mentioned, I've been working with, uh, with the city, county, state, uh, by AAA working group on looking at that segment of roadway that cuts um, in, in almost in its entirety through the Naval Academy property. 
Um, and I'm looking forward to a meeting next week as to continue looking at the feasibility options um, and, and begin discussing sort of what are the next steps and to, to move from feasibility to design. The, as John mentioned, real estate, uh, not real estate, but um, right away issues are very complicated and they're even more complicated when you get into federal property. So um, there's still a th number of things that we're that you know we're looking at and need to work out, but uh, I'm I'm hopeful that that we can find a, a path forward and 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 improving some pedestrian and bicycle safety issues through that corridor. Um, the only other thing I have is that um, last at the last city council meeting um, last week that the city accepted the federal funds through the Department of Defense Office of Economic Adjustment to do a, a large scale resilience. Uh, study for the city and the in the academy, um, and included in that funding was funds to do um, some design for intelligent traffic transportation signals on a number of signals throughout the um, city. So that is going to build off an ongoing study that the city is undertaking at assessing their transportation signals. So um, that will definitely help with emergency uh, response, but also just congestion and traffic flow. So. That though that you know bicycle, um, when we looked at our priorities, bicycle and pedestrian safety was one of my main main priorities as well as, as general congestion. So um, both projects are, are moving forward. They're just um, you know obviously as, as planning planning takes a lot of time, but uh, I'm hoping to learn more about the city's results of this of their existing signal um, assessment and then how this new federal funding can help build off that. Thank you. I'm looking forward to participating in that meeting next week. Um, next is David De Quincia. I have no um, nothing to add uh, at this time. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, before moving on to the transportation department update from Kwaku, and by the way, he did send a report which I've sent around to everybody. Uh, I just want to uh, point out that we have the mayor has nominated a number of people to fill vacancies on this transportation board. And I understand two of them may be present here, Elvia and Charles Brooks. Um, and I sent a, a somewhat, um, uh, well, not intemperate, but uh, a letter that I intended to be clear, uh, trying to encourage the city to move on these nominations. They've been languishing too long. And uh, my hope is that LA will be influential in causing something to happen. You're muted, LA. Yeah, no need. Um, if that was an apology or anything, no need, because <laughs> I, I understand, totally understand the frustration. I mean, you are, you are, you are volunteers. You're volunteering your time and you're held up by the city. Um, and it, bad luck. Um, last meeting, I, I had to um, cancel, the, for lack of a better word, the transportation committee meeting where they were up for recommendation um, uh, because of um, the foot surgery. So we will make sure everything is in order uh, for the next meeting. I don't, I don't think Hillary's on this call, but yes, there is a, a sense of urgency at this point. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you're attending uh, and knowing that you in inevitably will be um, appointed. No pressure, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> well, the pressure is coming from me. <laughs> no, I'm totally, under totally understood. And the other thing that's disappointing now that we do is when they do get to council, because of trying to, for brevity of the meeting, we put them in first reader. So you know, you don't get that recognition, which is, I think is unfortunate. I know the last meeting I, for, for the good of the order, I spelled out the, the new, um, you know, the new people, because again, you're, you're volunteering your time. Um, so it's on me right now. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. We look Thank forward you. to success. Uh, next item is uh, E, the transportation department update and, and Kwaku has been patient. Are you still with us? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Can, can you hear me? I can now. Okay. Uh, thank you for sending out the monthly report, which uh, documents uh, current activities in the department. Uh, first of all, if anybody has a question on that, I would like to uh, entertain that. 
Otherwise, uh, I will give a couple of highlights uh, from the report. And I believe on the care acts funds, I believe if I didn't tell you the other time, uh, MTA has informed us about uh, our portion of that uh, stimulus package from the federal government. Any question on the monthly report? Um, no, I just, I'm discouraged, but I understand that the ridership has plunged to a third of its uh, uh, normal value. Yeah, um, but that's the, one of the main highlights, not only in the transit operations. If you take a look at the table for parking activities across the board, whether it is for uh, parking enforcement or vehicles parked or citations, uh, we still see significant reductions compared to last year at around the same time. Uh, what you plan to do is uh, at the end of the first quarter in uh, FY21, we will plot a graph for the last three months uh, of uh, this current fiscal year versus uh, the same three months of uh, the previous fiscal year. Uh, for your information, if I have not mentioned that, uh, the CARES Act stimulus package, uh, FTA did get a lot of money. Uh, the state did receive its uh, share and uh, M.MTA did uh, has informed us that uh, we will receive just over $4 million to basically help offset the uh, significant reductions in revenues and also pay for some of the operating costs. Um, you may be able to use it for capital, but the prerequisites are such that we need to demonstrate that uh, the COVID-19 um, basically led to destruction or elimination of a bus or a facility. So our purpose is to use it uh, to support transit operations. Uh, actually, we have started requesting funding in the last quarter of FY 2020. And we hope to spend a uh, uh, few, um, I would say just about a million dollars uh, in FY 2021 to minimize the operation deficit. And then hopefully some will be left for FY 2022. So that's all that I have for now. I have a question about the status of a of a project we have discussed before, and that is uh, providing information to transit riders at uh, at each bus stop on uh, what buses come there, what their schedule is, access to an app which provides this information, and so forth. Is there any progress forward on that? Uh, not not. Not at this time, uh, if you will recall, we were thinking of running um, uh, kind of a general on, general on demand service and then using that as a pilot project. Uh, because we don't have the capital funds for it right now, uh, it's on hold. Uh, however, I'm happy to let you know that uh, through the Transportation Association of Maryland, we, most of the transit agencies are looking at this technology. So I believe uh, the best way to approach it is uh, kind of procurement by most of the transit agencies who would like to use that particular technology. Typically, when MTA uh, finds that many people are interested, they will put a bid out and then we can pick it back on that. But at this time, uh, we don't have the money to move forward with that. Uh, so that is on hold. Okay, let me just uh, express a little frustration on this. It seems not a very high tech uh, requirement to simply put at every bus stop information like what bus stops here and what is its schedule. This doesn't sound like rocket science. and I'm a little frustrated that this basic information is not available to transit riders. Yeah, I understand, but remember we need to uh, budget for that. We don't have uh, any funding for it right now, uh, not in the city operating budget. Uh, in fact, for even for FY21 grants, 
Uh, if you have taken a look at the CTP that came out, Annapolis was specifically mentioned. Uh, uh, total preventive maintenance capital grant actually has been eliminated. So again, we don't have even a dollar in grant for preventive maintenance. So these are some of the issues that transit operations in Annapolis are facing now. But we are still looking into that. Um, the fact that we don't have the money doesn't mean that we are not talking to vendors. Actually, we do. Uh, we just finished a three-day uh, virtual um, uh, annual meeting uh, for all the transit agencies. And we have quite a few vendors who actually uh, did talk about that kind of technology. So we are ready once the funding becomes available. OK, thanks for the update. Um, is there any new business that any members of the board would like to advance? That being the case, a, uh, a motion to adjourn may be in order. Can I just make a little tiny announcement? Please. <laughs> So Annapolis Green is doing uh, uh, several events at the end of the month around National Drive Electric Week, which is related to this, it's transportation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so I just wanna bring that to your attention. Um, we're, doing some, we're doing a very small event on Maryland Avenue during one of the, the nights when the street is closed for outdoor dining. Um, and then we're having a virtual event uh, and how, how are you publicizing all of this? Oh, uh, well, you're, you're going to get okay. You're gonna good. Get it, <laughs> you're going to get it soon. Uh, and then we're uh, putting some cars out on West Street on Friday, October 2nd as well. Good. But the virtual event uh, will have a lot of really good stuff, uh, a lot of good information. We'll answer all the questions that, that you might have about driving electric, which today is not only doable, but also totally normal. <laughs> <laughs> good. Thanks so much. Any other announcements or contributions? All right. Uh, all in favor of adjourning? Aye. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, everybody who participated. And we'll see you next month. And I'll follow with uh, some written communications on things that we discussed today. Bye. Thanks, Kurt.